picture of the St. Lawrence settlement area from 1859 to try to see if we can match anything up. And then lastly, there was a pastor Streeter who wrote his autobiography and he was all over the place in 1850 writing about Franklin Trost and Franklin Lust and Franklin Muth and Franklin Hilf and Seawood and Lower Saginaw and Upper Saginaw and the Saginaw Bay and the Indians and the missions. So it's really a cool book in German that I'm just going to pull out a few details to share with you because I think they're interesting. So where did this map come from? The picture on the left you see is the confirmation house of St. Lawrence. And then in 1945, it became an exhibit for the centennial of Franklin within St. Lawrence. And so they kept the old wood stove in there from the school and put a lot of artifacts in there that people donated or that people didn't want anymore. <laughs> Um, the cabinet there that you see on the left is a bookcase and it has some drawers underneath it for storing other materials. Well, if you remember Anita Zender Bold, some of you, she actually was a St. John's Church member, but she was the St. Lawrence Church Tour expert. And so when she was in the museum, she started looking around, what's in here, what's in here, and she found the map. Now this picture here, is from St. John's Church because it's um, acknowledging her translation of the Byerline missionary um, memoirs of when he was in Franklin within Bethany by um, St. Louis, Michigan. And she translated that from his German into English and got it published. So she definitely was a historian at heart. If you know Jimmy Schreiner, this was her mother. This is what the map looks like in the museum. It looks like a reverse copy. And um, it's got some tape marks on it. And you can see the river at the bottom. And then, of course, in 1848, there was no typewriter. Anyway, you can see on the right-hand side is a column of, of typewritten notes that someone added later. His name is Zahn, Z-A-H-N. We don't know who he is. So we're going to kind of look at this a little bit up closer now. We don't know who drew the map. We're wondering, we're wondering if it was Johann Adam List because he was involved with building in the community. But who knows? We aren't really sure who got the map, but we think it went to Germany to um, encourage more people to immigrate to the colonies. Kind of makes sense. Um, by looking at who's on the map and who's not on the map, our best guess is it was drawn in 1848. And of course, some people could have been on the ocean getting here in 1848, or just arriving but hadn't built a house yet or bought land yet. So it's just some moment around that time. We don't know how this copy got to the Franklin Museum and the St. Lawrence Church Museum, but it's there. And we don't know who this Mr. Zahn is who typed up those notes. Then the museum has a better copy of it. It's, it's uh, white and black and white so you can read it a little bit better. Um, this is the whole map, and so it has Frank and Trost to the north at the top, and then it's got Holland Road there that the Trost settlers are on. There's a connection with the Angled Road and Damo Road towards Frankenmuth, and then you see two roads of Frankenmuth. One is Tuscola Road, which they called the Old Path to Tuscola and Bridgeport, or the Lower Path, and then the second one is on Genesee Street now, which was called the New Road to Bridgeport and to school. Um, I don't know if there were any other streets or roads at this time, I can't tell, other than you can see Damo and Holland and um, Genesee and Tuscola are, are drawn down, uh, wider. 
Um, it's not shown in here, but by this year, the Cass River would have had its dam and the first mill built by the Hogan's. And if you look at the south side of the river, there is nobody there. It is smooth. Um, I got some because there's no bridge. You guys see okay? <laughs> so now I enlarge the Frank and Trost piece of it, and um, you can see here is this is what they had as the path to, to cut an angle to go from Frank and Trost to Frank and Ruth, or vice versa. And, oops, too many buttons. Okay. This is where Bender Road is now, but you can see that it had been this long path and like Wes Reinbold and I were talking, if you're in Frank and Trust, you want to have a Frank and Ruth, you want to start angling in that direction as soon as you can. And the other thing is that Frank and Trost was selected to be between two creeks, Bloomfield Creek and Cool Creek. So it makes sense that you would walk between those two creeks where you're on higher ground somewhat. This map is labeled with a church symbol here next to a settler's home named Munker. And then also it's labeled that there is church land over here. And this green line I drew in is now Mueller Road in Frankentrost. And Wesley told me that um, that road was part of the congregation's land. So I don't want to say anything more about Frankentrost because that's Wesley Reinbold's department. <laughs> um, this line here, is labeled as the old path from Bridgeport to Lower Saginaw. So that would be base, you know, south side base city. So that was already a path. And you can see that um, now the settlers have several options here where they can walk to. Um, I put some names on some of the roads. I'm just not, I don't know when they became roads actually. So um, I think we're good there. Then I enlarged the Frankenmuth portion of the map, and I put in yellow what looks like a real road. So here's, so here's Dama Road, here's Junction Road, Genesee, and here is Tuscola Road. And we believe this Tuscola was an Indian trail. Dave, is that okay to say? Along the river. And if you drive Tuscola or run it on a race, you know it's got lots of hills <laughs> and lots of creeks or brooks or gullies that cross it. So it's not a good traveling road. So it certainly makes sense to go a little bit farther north where you have level ground and now you've got a better connection to go towards Bridgeport um, and Tuscola. Of course, Tuscola was already in, in existence and Bridgeport had a post office where these Germans could get some mail. You can see that um, the settlers are, a lot of them are along Genesee, and a lot of them then also along Tuscola. Here's the first log church, denoted by this symbol here, close to the river. And then, um, so again, it goes from Maple Road here, Dyer, Damel, Guerra, and you can see there is no main street as far as I can tell. It's just a, it's just a line on the map um, because there was no bridge. And then here's Block Road over here. Then with that key that Mr. Zahn had on the map, I used my limited computer abilities to try to point out where the people are living along um, Tuscola Road and along Genesee. And it's kind of hard to read them sideways, but we'll turn, it over, turn the map around so it uh, gets us a little bit better bearings. So now we're looking from, oops, 
Okay. We're looking from east to the west. So this is who's on the map around 1848. And so here, here's our river. Nobody's on the south side. There are no Canadians around here yet. <laughs> Here's, here's the Indian path that became Tuscola Road. Here's Genesee that was called the New Road. Here is Dama Road. Um, so these are the names of the people who are on the map. Um, so say you're, um, say you're walking from Tuscola to see the big settlement of Frankenmuth. So if you're coming from the east, the very first farm on this map is the Palm Rider Farm. And I believe Frunk Road would be right about in that vicinity. <coughs> Next, you have a parcel by Mr. Zender, Hairline, Fadis, which is near now our main street. That's a street in Frankenmuth. Runzenberger, Schleier, we have that street name in that part of town. Bayer Line, Eddie, does that look like the right place for a Bayer Line to live? Here's a Weitengruber. Then this is called Church Land, which was set aside right away by the by the settlers who each donated some some uh, funds for that. And this green line will later become Church Grove Road, just to kind of help you get your bearings. Okay. So now we're on the other side of Church Grove, and of course this is where our school is, the St. Martin School is now. Here's Lawrence Lazel has a property here. And at the corner of Damel and Junction is Martin Haspel, one of the first 15 settlers. Right across Damel then here is one of my ancestors, the Stern family. Then Lycom, Bickel, one of my ancestors. Nichterlein. Now we're kind of in the Bayer Road area. Bernthal, Rodmer, Nichterlein, Beerlein. And I believe this beer line up here near Maple Road would be where um, Wink and Marie Beerline's place would be. Now let's go to the, this side of the street. We've got a, a Mr. Arnold who owns property over here. Then Hubinger Brothers have farmland as well as other land, which becomes the city of Frankenmuth, the dam across the river, the mill. And then we've got one of the first 15, Weber or Weber with several parcels. We've got Lawrence Lazel with a parcel over here. This little creek here shown is what you see when you go across to Stola Road and you go downhill by Tom Weitner's house and then uphill towards St. Lawrence Church. So here we've got Johann List, one of the settlers, Pickleman, one of the settlers, uh, depicted right here, very close to the church here, which probably also uh, was where the pastor also lived. And here is Johann Beerline, and this house is, is the White House right across from St. Martin's Church, or that, that location anyway. And he was called the Wasser Beerline because he was the Beerline who lived by the river, and he loved to read the pastor's books late at night. <laughs> this, now this line is Dama Road, but of course Dama Road used to jog, and now it goes straight through. But this property here was called Mission Land. And there's some little symbol here. I'm not sure if that's supposed to be a little wigwam or what that's supposed to be. Then we have a bower, a sitterding, and um, Dorothy Cook wanted me to know that this is Elmer Cook's ancestry through the fish hoppers, the sitterding family. Then Bernthal is shown here with this parcel, this parcel, and this one across. We've got Johann, Johann Adam List here on Tuscola, past Bayer, Lauder, and Rodimer is the last one that's on the map there. And sometimes the old maps will call Tuscola Road or Rodimer Road if you've seen that sometimes in the Atlas. Any questions, any corrections? Here, yeah. 1845. And that's the next map. Yeah, the very when it first of the 
of the Germans, yes, but there, there would have been some uh, traitors out there to that. Like the Kampal family. Now the map is again with north up and west and east. So what I did was I, I erased everybody who wasn't here in 1845 to just kind of see, well, what did Franklin kind of look like back in 1845? So these are the properties that were owned by those first settlers, whether they had them all right away in 1845 or bought some more later, I don't know that. So, um, so here is Junction Road, here is Damel, and so the Huskell couple, which were founding of, founding, founders of Frankfurt are here, Lawrence Lazel has property here, and then Church Land is here where Church Grove Road now is. Um, the Huskells also have some property over here. And now we're going along, there's there's some buildings along Genesee and they aren't labeled, so I don't know what they are. Is that a barn or what is it? I don't know. So along, now we're along Tuscola Road here. Johann Leonhard Bernthal has these parcels here. Um, this is the Mission Land piece, which is, this is now Damo Road extending across with the bridge. Here's the original first log church. And um, near the church is Wasser Beer Line, where that um, White House is across from the church. We've got Pastor Kramer, of course, and his wife living in the church in Parsonage. Then we've got Peckhamans shown here close to the church. We've got uh, the Vabers over here on Tuscola, where they still are. And uh, we, like I said, Lawrence Lazel and Johann and Maria List are also very close here in the church area. And you know, they all had to help together to clear some land and to build some basic shelters and structures, so I think it certainly made sense for them at least right at the start to live pretty close to the church and help out the pastor. Any comments or questions? The mission land area, was that a one time called Georgetown? Yes, yes, the neighborhood, the neighborhood of homes there, you are correct, where they're all real tight along um, to school here was named Georgetown, I believe because of George Runzenberger who lived there. So it's kind of cute. <laughs> yes? Why did they settle in this area? Okay. Um, it was recommended to them because of, uh, there were various pastors in Michigan um, doing mission work with the Indians. The U.S. government was selling off land after they had treaties with various Indian tribes for various pieces of land. And so at this time, there was a pastor, Schmidt, in Ann Arbor, who I believe um, directed them in this, to this area and said this would make good farming land. Because what they wanted to do was get rid of every single tree and turn it into good farmland. And so, of course, you, might, but you could look at the kinds of trees that are growing on land, and you could definitely make decisions about what kind of ground that would be there. Then I thought, well, of those 1845 places, what do we have there now in those areas? So, over here in the west, here's the corner of Bayer Road and Junction Road, and that's Eddie Ruprecht and his wife. And then we have, oops, doing that again. And we have Burnfall Packing on Junction near Bayer, and then at this corner here, where uh, the Huskell family was. We now have Don and Julie Lazel Duvernoy, and Julie is a descendant of the Lazel family that's always been there at that corner. Uh, Bill Lazel is her father. Here's the Church Grove. Here's St. Martin's School now, and then Franconian Estates is in between there. Then um, on along Tuscola, we've got at the corner of, of Tuscola, and Dama Road, we've got John and Drew Deering's house right there in that area of the Indian Mission. And then we've got the, if you know Amy Van Warmer, um, they have that farmhouse right at the corner there. Then is the Yerke House, 
still standing there. And we've got now then our, in this place, we've got our St. Lawrence Church Museum, the old cemetery, and the St. Lawrence Church is here. And we still have Weber descendants living on their property um, at the Coglin House. Any questions or comments? Yes, Ken. What was the name of that um, class fronted building that was on the south side of Tuscola Road? It got removed so that the new roadway would go down to the new bridge, and John and Drew Dieterding's geography was part of that. What the heck was that old store called there? Was the oh, the, the Shriner store you're talking about? That's what it was, Shriner store. Which was the Rutzenberger store, I believe. Okay. I never went shopping there. <laughs> too late. Too late now. <laughs> So anyway, I just think it's interesting to see who, who is living on spots that were occupied in 1845 by, by something. Now we have a watercolor. This is the first picture of the St. Lawrence Church area. So of course, we are standing at the east before the gully and looking westward on Tuscola. And I thought it would be interesting to try to figure out what are these different buildings here shown in 1859. Are any of them from that first map of 1848? Um, what about Mr. Streeter's memories of 1850? Does he talk about any of these places? Maybe we can figure something out here. So you can, just like now when you go across Tuscola, there's the low area where, where there's the creek crossing, so that would be here. And then you can see way back when, they didn't have um, Tuscola drop down deeper um, for, for less of a climb up the hill. So that's why um, now there's an embankment on the cemetery side and a lot of steps on the church side as they lowered that road to make the hill less steep. Is this focused okay? Is it, can you see it okay? Any questions, comments? Okay. So this is kind of the view below of this area, and there's so many evergreen trees that you can't see a whole lot of, um, of the buildings that are there now. Um, but that's sort of the area. Now the next thing we're going to do, well, I'm going to take a drink first. <laughs> so there's a, there's a book that was published in German in 1904, and it's the Lebenslauf, or the life's story of Pastor Johannes Streeter. And um, there he is with his wife. They celebrated their golden anniversary in Franken Lust because a daughter of theirs was married to teacher List there. And he was deaf, so he couldn't hear any of the proclamations given for the golden anniversary. So his wife really couldn't ever say to him, you never listen. <laughs> But um, he was in this area when all this stuff was happening with missionaries and settlements and building roads and, and starting communities like Frank and Trost and Lust and Hilf. And he was going to Lower Saginaw Bay City. He was in Saginaw Bay. He was on boats. He was on horses. So all of his memories are in this book, and it's really good. And I just think he probably... At that young age, when he was here, he probably kept a diary because so many things were happening. I mean, they were starting to write things in the Chippewa language for the first time. Um, all this, this was an international mission effort between Germany and America. Um, all these settlers were coming. He was um, deciding if he wanted to become a teacher or a 
pastor or a missionary or none of the above. So he was traveling with all these different pastors to conferences and so on and um, remembers them very well. I don't know because I, I didn't even actually read the whole book because I took a vacation. <laughs> His sister was married to Pastor Oak. Who okay. Was his sibling he did the first summer. Sure. So his ties go back and yeah. forth. So I'll talk a little bit about his family, but as Dave may have pointed out, he has a personal collect connection to missions because his sister married missionary Alf, who was working in Seawing. So he would go and visit, obviously, his family and see how mission work happens. How do you learn the language of Chippewa Indians you've never met before? Um, so that gave him great exposure to a brand new mission endeavor with a brand new language that had never been learned before. He was deaf, you said. At the time of his golden anniversary, oh. yes, he was deaf. So I don't know how long. He, he did listen to his wife for quite a while, I think. And then, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dan? Yes. Are you aware that he is a great grandfather to Ann Brunner? Yeah. Well, yeah, oops. <laughs> yes, Marilyn, I am aware of that. <laughs> That was written up somewhere, and I, so I called her to, to check on that, and she said, yes, this is, yeah. that man was her great-grandfather, and he is also an ancestor of Charlie and Matt Kern, um, and so there's definitely connections. So um, here is a family picture of the Johann Streeter. So here he is, his wife, and the children. Um, so here's here kind of the bullet points of his life. He was born in 1829, so that means he was 21 years old when he was writing, when he was in Frankenmuth and, and experiencing these things. His parents and family immigrated from Swabia, Schwaben, to Ann Arbor. They knew exactly where they were coming because there were other Schwaben already living in Ann Arbor. And Pastor Schmidt, I believe, was also um, from Swabia. Pastor Schmidt in Ann Arbor is really encouraging mission work with the Indians, and so he is talking to Pastor Alf, who's married to Streeter's sister. So she is living in Seawing. Um, Mr. Streeter's parents died already in 47, 48, and so now he's, he has to figure out what to do, where to go, what to, where to live. He decides to help out at the Alf house and mission in Seawing. So he's helping with some of the Indian mission work, helping in the house and living there with him. And by 1850, Pastor Kramer, uh, he talks to Pastor Kramer and he says, I don't know, and maybe I should be a missionary, maybe I should be a pastor, maybe I should be a teacher, I'm just praying about it, I'm not sure. And so Pastor Kramer said, well, I'm heading back to Frankenmuth, why don't you come with me, I'll give you some instructions and see if you could become a pastor, because I would say you have to be able to learn Hebrew and Greek. It's not an easy thing to do, so you can't just jump to Fort Wayne Seminary. So that's what he decided to do, and that's how he got to Frankenwood, and then saw all these things happening. And two of his sons were teachers in Frankenwood um, with, at the schoolhouses. So one was called the Village School, or Central School, which, is, which was on School Street, and I think one was the Western School on Junction Road. Not sure of that. Any questions or comments? Marilyn? No? no? Okay. No, I had a teacher named Streeter. Mm hmm So that was one of them. Yeah. Wow. In fact, in my office at Brothers, I had uh, Teacher Streeter's desk. Wow. Wow. Good. And also one of the Streeters was a missionary in Brazil, where my grandpa Sutta was also a missionary at the same church. Okay, did you hear that from Fran Rice? Another son of Streeter was a missionary that you said in Brazil? And I talked about that. Mm -hmm, okay. And grandpa Sutta, who was the teacher here, was mm -hmm. also a missionary. Okay. A lot of connections. So 
what I did next was I looked at this first watercolor of the church area and I tried to look at his writings about what was going on in 1850 and see if I could figure out what building is what. So of course he was writing what 1850, this watercolor was drawn in 1859 so in nine years a lot of things could have been built that weren't there when Pastor Streeter was, was here and writing. So for sure I know that this is the frame church. And it was built in 1852, so it wasn't here when Streeter was writing about Frank with in 1850. And maybe this was the log church here that they were using, but I'm not really sure what log house is what on this picture, so I don't want to commit myself. Here's another log house here. There's a fence between the church and here. I think this looks like the little tombstones here. This would be where they hung their two bells from Germany to ring. And this is a fancy fence along the front of the church, and I think like a fancy gate opening maybe there. Um, so I was trying to figure out, well, whose house is this? Was it the List family that lived west or east of the church property? Could it have been the pastor's house? Um, all I know is that Streeter in 1850 said um, that the Kramer house was east of the log church. The west end of the house was closer to the road. It had, uh, I'm sorry, the west end was um, farther from the road. It was all kitchen. The east side was um, a front half of bedroom and study for Pastor Kramer. And the back was a living room. And upstairs is where they had two divided areas for men and women to sleep. But they all shared, shared space with the bugs, lots and lots of bugs here. And so this um, streeter pastor was also sleeping up there in the loft in that house. But I'm not sure, is this the house, is this the, I, I don't know. But you can see different kinds of farm fences here, lots of rail fences because there's so much wood. But of course, for the church, you need a nice fence. Dan? Yes? You have a frame, frame of reference. Those two stones you have, those are the earliest two stones. Franklin Okay. In that, in that okay. So Dave is thinking this would be the first log church from 1846. I, I can't say for sure, but we're just trying to figure it out. And so, like Dave said, this is the very earliest graves of the, of the St. Lawrence Cemetery of School. Now, from Streeter's book, he mentions that on the north side of Tuscola Road was a long log building. Half was the school. The other half was the house of teacher Pinkham. Pinkham Pink. And after school was out with the children, teacher Pinkham Pink would tutor Streeter and a few other men who are considering ministry, and he would teach them reading, writing, singing, and as Mr. Streeter called it, scratching on the violin. <laughs> so probably not real talented there. So I'm not sure, you know, is this the school here, half school, half teacher? Is this a parsonage that was built later? Um, but again, it's called the Kirche und das Pfarrhaus von Front, was the church and parsonage of so, um, anyway, the more I look at this, the less I know. For sure. <laughs> Any questions or thoughts? Yes? Do you know where the name Franklin came from and what does it mean? The, I'm sorry? Do you, know, do you know where the name of Franklin came oh, from? Oh, sure. What does it mean? Sure. So, it was chosen for this settlement, I believe, before they got here. Franken is the German word for Franconia, the northern part of Bavaria, where they came from. And Mut is the German word for courage, because they would need some courage to get, to, to buy, to, to go to a country they've never seen, and buy land they've never seen, and never see their family and parents ever again. So it takes some courage to do that. Anything else? Go ahead. So, one step further, what do the others mean? Okay. So our next lecture will be about Frankentrost, which Wesley will tell us, 
And Trost is the German word for comfort. And the thought was that another colony of more settlers would bring, would bring comfort to the first settlers because it would be more community, more helpers, more workers, etc. Then after that was Franken Lust towards Bay City, which is desire of the, or joy or desire of the Franconians. And lastly, Franken Hilf, the help of the Franconians. Okay. And? Yes. Okay. Uh, about that cemetery there. Um, my forefather that came in 1845, the Paulus Lawrence Grieber, is in that very first row. And those uh, rows of cemetery stones are very close to where Bob Schmitzer's house uh -huh. presently is. Okay. So that matches the picture is what you're saying, Ken, that a very early burial spot is, yes. is towards the, the front, lower part of that cemetery. Okay. Now, I'm just going to go through some of the interesting things that are read in the Struder book. Okay, what does that mean, Heidi? Five minutes? Oh, no. <laughs> so, Streeter is in Seabowing, and his sister, if the uh, missionary, has employed a very nice young lady who needs to go home to Frankenwith again to get married. And so he writes that um, Alf went on a horse, and, the, and this girl went on the, another horse, and they rode 50 miles to Frankenwith to the forest. Well, I know exactly who this girl is, because she's my great-great-grandmother. And this picture here shows Anna Sophia Stern, who married George Adam Bickle, and they married in 1850, which is the year that Streeter is running around here. And her father had died, and her mother said, as soon as you turn 18, you need to get married, we need a man on the farm again. And so three days after her 18th birthday, she, she got married. So this, is their, this is their 50th wedding anniversary. But anyway, isn't that cool that his story in the book matches what uh, my uh, relative um, from, from the Bickle site, Clara, Bar no, Nora Barger, is that right? Nora Barger uh, mentioned that story. Here's another one. Uh, he remembers that Pastor Schmidt in um, Ann Arbor um, decided not to join the Missouri Synod once they started organizing. Um, he, so this is Streeter's words, he says that um, this Schmidt said that those Frank and, right, Franconian people, they are half Catholic. They are, they are lighting candles for, for, for communion. The pastor is singing at the altar. He's turning his back to the people sometimes. And he's even making the sign of the cross. So this French Frederick Schmidt said he's not joining up with these Missouri Synod half Catholic people. And he, he even thought that making the sign of a cross was a sign of the living Satan. And I have no idea how that thought could ever come into someone's mind. Um, here he talks about going to Saginaw and his brother in law bought him a black cloth to turn into a suit. And then he, oops, then he goes to the Bernthal family on Tuscola, and the father is a wagon maker, and the son, he thinks the second son, is a tailor. And so he takes his cloth to the tailor and gets made the nicest, most beautiful suit he's ever worn. And then the bottom paragraph here says, um, to pay for the tailoring work, he was given a cradle to go harvest wheat in the wheat field and work off the price of his suit. And because back then there was just never enough manpower to do all the crop harvesting, and they said as soon as they could, they would do the threshing then after that. And this might be a picture of what harvesting with a cradle could have looked like. Um, it, would include, it was an improvement on just a scythe where everything just fell down. 
Here's another memory. Every day, that morning and evening was church service. It was there was singing. Pastor Kramer preached from a small um, pulpit, and then after that, the men and the women sang alternate lines of the hymns back and forth, which he thought was very beautiful. And then every Friday was private confession, and every Sunday was Nachtmahl, which we would say now Abendmahl or Holy Communion. Another memory he has is that there was a structure with the two bells from Germany, a bigger bell and a smaller, and every day a one of these bells would be rung, it was called the Beitglocke, the prayer bell, and it said, when you heard that bell, everyone who was on the road or in the field or in the house stood still. The men took their caps off, everyone folded their hands, and they prayed, Ach, bleib bei uns, Herr Jesu Christ. So that was their community tradition that they did once a day when they heard that bell. He also said that every Friday at 3 o'clock, one of those bells would ring to remind people of the death of Christ on Good Friday. And he often was one of the bell ringers. And so we have Good Friday coming up this week, and you can just think, do we think of Good Friday every Friday of the year? That's what they were doing to remind them um, of their Christian heritage and religion. I'm almost done. He remembers that um, Tuscola was to the east, and the, the Hoogingers built a dam in Frankenmuth, and it screwed up the lumber, or the, the logs, from Tuscola getting to a mill. And so there was a lawsuit. And the Hoopingers had to appear in Tuscola for this lawsuit. And so they had to hire a lawyer from Saginaw who spoke English. And so Pastor Kramer told this Mr. Streeter, you go along with them and listen to what the people are saying in English and then say it in German so everybody knows what's going on. So this lawyer from Saginaw, I guess he was very good and high priced. He talked a long time, and the judge decided um, not guilty. So the dam could stay, and the Tuscola people uh, let the Hoobingers go in peace. Uh, here he talks about Kramer in 1850, uh, still had contact with Indians. There was a family not too far from the church in a shanty, an older chief or elder with his old wife, um, but she was pushed aside because he also had a younger wife. And so the younger wife had younger children, the older wife had older children in a, in a shanty, so that must have been fun. And every Sunday, they would come uh, to the pastor's house, and Kramer would instruct them, and Heinrich, his son, would translate, and then after church service, they would get a, um, a bowl full of corn soup with bacon, which they loved. So um, this is, I believe, my last slide, and I thought we could all join together and say this prayer that the settlers said every day when the bell rang. And it's a hymn in the German hymn book, and Pastor Jim Weber told me, yes, he thinks this would have been what they would have used, because you could remember a hymn that rhymes very easily. So we're going to say it in German first and in English, and then I'm done, unless there's questions. Mm -hmm. So join me if you can. Ach, bleib bei uns, der Jesu Christ, weil es nun Abend worden ist, dein göttlich Wort, das Ende liegt, lass ja bei uns auslöschen nicht. And then it's an English translated hymn, Lord Jesus Christ, with us abide, for one of us falls in even time. O let your word, that saving light, shine forth undimmed into the night. Well, that's what I prepared for you. Any questions? Um, so, is that uh, thing that translated the uh, memoirs or whatever? Dave, do you know what the status yeah, of it? Uh, there's a translation of it. Uh, <coughs> there's a pastor currently working on translating a bit by a pet. And uh, he's not a member of the Missouri Synod that had in contact with but there is also a translation. 
which I think might be available to the museum here that was done previously. Mm -hmm. Oh, that book? Yeah. Out of memoirs or whatever? Thank you. So, I had heard somebody comment that maybe that English translation wasn't so good, so I just thought, Mary Nature Lane loaned me the German book and I just read it in German and it was pretty easy to understand, so that's why. Any more questions? Any more comments? Thoughts? Corrections? <laughs>